connecting to the server. Okay. Right. Well, uh, welcome everyone. Hello to all people in the room. Hello to people online. Uh, welcome back, Joe. Thank you very much. It's nice to be um, back. Yeah. yeah. So this is the problem. So I've been, I'm now part of the furniture at Euclid. Yeah. Uh, so remind us again, what was your precise time window? Gosh, uh, you click. So I joined you click as a postdoc in 2012. And I was here for about four and a half years. Oh, yes. Yeah. Great years. Thank of course, you. it's always great. Thank years, you. Yeah, it's, it's very kind. Yeah. yeah. So, well, yeah. look for And of course, then after that, you went up to New York, taking on lectureship. Yeah, I did work at the OU for a while. So yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I'm doing my introduction, aren't I? Yeah. yeah. So, okay. Uh, thank you. <laughs> thank you, you Duncan. Yeah. I'll just sit down. And, uh, I appreciate the effort. Yeah. So, so yes, nice. I was a postdoc at UCL working on the Climate Project uh, with Anna Cox and, and lots of other people. Uh, and then I went to the OU as a lecturer for a couple of years. And then I went to the University of York as a lecturer and I've been there for, for five years. Um, so it's very nice to be back and to, to see some of your faces and obviously lots of new ones as well. Um, and yeah, today I'm gonna to be talking about um, some work I've done looking at well-being and reflection, um, and I'm going to be talking mainly about this particular game. Um, but I'm also going to be talking a little bit about um, some of the work or two strands of research that I've been involved in. So one is around games and well-being. The second is about games and reflection. And then the bulk of the talk is going to be um, talking about the student life balance game that was designed to get students thinking about their own work life balance um, and talking about the evaluation of, of that. So uh, to get started, uh, so in terms of games and well-being, uh, if when you hear those words, these are the kinds of things you think of, that games are horrible and make people feel rubbish and are addictive, uh, then I'm sorry you're at the wrong talk, because um, I'm going to be focusing more on the positive side effects of games, right? So that's not to say that gaming cannot sometimes be problematic, um, but the research that I've been involved in has mainly been looking at, well, when is it beneficial, how is it beneficial, um, and the different ways in which it can be. So uh, I'm starting with the, the kind of statement that video games can be beneficial to well-being. Um, for instance, they have uh, been shown to help people recover from uh, work-life stress. So there's been a bunch of research looking at this, including some work done by, by Anna and Emily Collins. And the idea is that games are able to um, help people recover through providing these different sorts of experiences. So psychological detachment in the sense that they allow people to mentally disengage um, from uh, their work environments. Uh, they're relaxing, so they kind of offer opportunities for sort of low activation in terms of energy, um, but also kind of experience more positive sorts of emotions and affect. Mastery in the sense that uh, they allow people to experience kind of learn, learning and challenges outside of their work domain um, and feelings of kind of accomplishment as a result of playing games. And then finally control in the sense that games are something that people choose to do. So it's something they are um, actively choosing to get involved in. Um, and this allows them to experience things like self-efficacy and competence. Um, and there's been some suggestion that uh, the reason that games can do this is because they are immersive experiences, right? They absorb our attention, that they take us to kind of different worlds. Uh, and luckily, we have somebody in the room who has done work on this. So John, sitting at the back there, uh, presented this paper um, at CHI earlier this year, um, basically looking at, um, well, doing a survey where um, he asked players about their experiences of game playing and measuring uh, immersion and um, post-work uh, recovery. So there was a couple of things here, but there does seem to be some relationship between this idea of immersion and post-work recovery, particularly, um, so stronger results were found around cognitive involvement. So the ways in which that games can cognitively absorb our attention, right? They help us to detach because they help us to, they allow us to think about something else for a little while. And this gives us opportunities um, to recover. Um, but more than that, John also found that, that people are actively engaged in this process, right? They, they experience a sort of uh, immersion kind of optimization process where they're looking for games that um, can satisfy their recovery needs through creating uh, particular experiences um, that help them to, to recover um, over time. Um, so as I said, John has done more work on this, so please, if you have questions about the specific details of the study, um, it's worth chatting to him about and is further exploring exactly how um, this sort of immersion occurs and, and how diff the ways in which different games can um, support that as well. So that's one aspect of the uh, games and wellbeing um, sort of literature I've been involved in. Uh, the other is looking at gaming as a, as a form of coping. 
So this isn't just about recovering from work stress and kind of day-to-day -day stress. It's about how games might help us kind of get through difficult life experiences. Um, so these are things like relationship breakdowns or losing the job or perhaps physical or, or mental health kind of issues. And essentially what we found here is that, you know, yes, there can be situations where games can be used for avoidance, so in a more negative way, um, but a lot of the people that we, we spoke to as part of our study um, were talking about the benefits of games. And in particular, talking about gaming as providing like a necessary respite. So again, it's back to this idea of games giving you something else to do and focus on to give you a break from what you were going through in your day-to-day -day life and allowing you a chance to, to kind of um, emotionally sort of recover from that as well. Uh, in addition, we also saw that games help provide people with a sense of connection. And sometimes that was about other players that they played with, um, but also occasionally with characters within the game uh, as well. Um, a way to process emotions. So, so gaming sometimes helped people work through kind of difficult feelings that they were experiencing at the time. Um, stimulating personal growth. So this was games um, helping people learn and, and kind of grow as a person, um, but also acting as a, as a lifeline. So giving people something to hang on to when everything else seems um, quite uh, uh, problematic and, and difficult um, at that particular stage. So I have a couple of students um, at York who are currently looking more at this kind of idea of, of games as, as a form of coping and, and trying to understand more about what it is about specific games um, that can help coping in, in different sorts of ways. Um, but one of the students, Laura, recently uh, published a study at FDG, so the Foundations of, of Digital Games uh, Conference, about a study she did looking specifically at a persistent low mood population. So these are people that, that may be suffering from, from depression, it's not necessarily clinically diagnosed, um, but they're self-reporting that they have um, persistent experiences of feeling low. Um, and what she found here is that, that games uh, are similarly, there's some similar things around um, this idea of people finding focus in, in engaging games, um, but also looking for experiences that were predictable. So they found these kind of like consoling experiences because it's something that they, they knew what they were gonna get um, when they played particular games. And that was something kind of uh, reassuring uh, for them to engage in. Uh, they also gave uh, players a, an opportunity to kind of experience a, a sort of sense of success. Uh, and that might be uh, particularly uh, important for somebody who's experiencing low mood where they might not be experiencing that feeling um, elsewhere. Um, and generally, there was a sense of, of kind of valuing games as a as a uh, a way to to sort of help people feel a, a little bit better. On saying that, there were some instances where gaming could exacerbate kind of negative effects. So particularly if you if you play a game because you want to feel better about yourself, but you end up doing badly at the game, then, then that can actually reinforce those negative feelings and, and make you um, feel worse um, as well. OK, so that was just to give you a, a brief overview of some of the work I've done around games and well-being. The second strand of research um, that I want to introduce you to um, that I've been involved in is, is games and uh, reflection. So in terms of games and reflection, uh, this has sort of been an interest as, as my background has been in sort of learning and technology. So understanding like how people learn when they play and, and reflection was kind of an extension of this. And we did a study a few years back looking at, well, does reflection actually happen when people play games, um, commercial games? So when people are playing games as part of their sort of leisure um, type experience. So what we were interested in is here, does reflection occur? And if so, what sort of reflection is kind of happening? And what we did is we analyzed kind of players' accounts uh, of gameplay um, using a framework developed by uh, Ralph Fleck and, and Geraldine Spitz Patrick that talks about different levels of, of reflection. Now, I'm going to come back to this framework later when I talk about how we evaluated um, the student life balance game and talk in more detail about what it actually um, describes. But in terms of our findings from this study, we saw that reflection was actually a pretty common part of gameplay. So it's a, a common part of the general kind of player experience. Um, but um, we did see less of it at the higher levels of reflection. So particularly around transformative reflection when uh, players are um, experiencing things that get them thinking or behaving differently outside of the game, that wasn't something that we saw very often. But in terms of thinking about you know, how to approach the game differently and things like that, that, that was much more common. And as part of that, um, there's some work I've been involved in looking at uh, reflection in the context of, of perspective challenges. So how do games uh, make us think about things in different ways? And Matt Whitby's work, another PhD student at York uh, who I've been working with, uh, has been looking uh, exclusively at kind of perspective challenge 
um, and starting with looking at, well, how does perspective challenge occur again in commercial games? So these are the games that the people play for entertainment and for fun rather than serious games or, or applied games. So here um, he looks at the different ways in which games might support um, perspective challenge. And that's normally through different game elements such as narrative or mechanics or a combination of those. Um, but he also made a, an interesting distinction between different forms of transformative uh, reflection that can result um, from perspective challenge. So on the one hand, you've got kind of exo transformation, which is the kind of transformation I was talking to you about earlier, where something changes outside of the game, right? So a game gets you to think differently about a particular topic or changes how you behave um, in relation to, to different people or, or yourself even. So that's the exo transformation. But actually what he found was that perspective challenges were also leading to a lot of endo transformative, uh, sorry, endo transformative um, kind of uh, behaviors as well. So people were playing games, um, but then they were realizing that they should do something different within the game, um, or they changed their thinking about the game itself or things that were happening within the game. So that transformation is happening. It's just, it's within the confines of the game itself rather than, than doing things kind of outside. Um, of the game. And that was a lot more common um, than the exo transformation um, that, that occurs outside of the game. So um, while Matt was kind of looking at that um, as part of things that I've been interested in around reflection, um, the question then starts to become, well, how do you, okay, reflection's happening, perspective challenge is happening. How do you actually design games for the purpose of reflection? So if you want to intentionally get people to reflect on, on a particular issue or topic. And this interest actually stems back to, to my days on KaiMed uh, as a postdoc here, uh, when we ran a student game design competition where we wanted students to create games that would prompt reflection on human error and get people thinking uh, about things like blame culture within the context of healthcare. So this is about getting people to think about how when mistakes or errors happen in healthcare, it's not necessarily one individual's fault, there could be wider kind of systemic issues um, at play. So we did the game design competition. Uh, we got some entries uh, and we awarded kind of prizes to the games we thought were most successful at, at meeting the brief. Um, but when we did the evaluation, we did sort of ask people like, well, were you thinking about the game afterwards? But we didn't really explicitly look at reflection, right? It was kind of something that, that just boiled down to that thinking about rather than kind of establishing, well, what sort of reflection were they engaging in? And, and was it something that actually, you know, um, carry with them kind of afterwards. Um, so while we attempted to do it, um, I would say looking back on it now, that's something we didn't necessarily, we could have done in a different way. But there has been uh, increasing numbers of people talking about um, games for reflection, uh, including a, a Rilla Khaled who's written a paper, which is basically an agenda for reflective game design. And she describes uh, games as highly appropriate vehicles for reflection. And she thinks that they can do this by um, getting people to, um, raise questions. So instead of, you know, being didactic with games and teaching people facts and things like that, you can actually create games that get people kind of um, questioning uh, broader things, um, but also encourages uh, games to be thinking, game designers to be thinking about how to encourage more critical forms of reflection um, through their gameplay. That said, it's a conceptual piece. So it's based on her experience as a designer and, and looking at other kind of design work. But there is a distinct lack of um, empirical studies that are actually looking about, well, how do we design games and how do different design decisions actually influence uh, reflection in different ways? So that brings me to the student uh, life balance game. Uh, and this was a paper that was presented uh, last year at Kai Play. Uh, and I'm going to talk to you more about the, how we developed the game, uh, but also what the evaluation uh, showed. To dig a little bit deeper, though, into the motivation uh, behind the study, so I've got a kind of generic kind of description of what reflection is there, but it's certainly, it's, it's, it's sorry, it's more, it's, the term is used to really describe this kind of intellectual or effective activity, so things that we are thinking about and feeling um, that people are trying to kind of gain new understandings from, so that's the kind of key thing, that it leads to new understandings and appreciations. As I've kind of uh, said before, so reflection, people are often interested in it because it's seen as a, as a key component to transformational change. And there's a lot of HCI literature that is interested in how technology can help people um, behave or, or kind of think differently. However, despite the amount of work that's been looking at applied games in places like education or persuasion, um, reflection isn't something that is normally explicitly kind of focused on. So it's not something that we have really looked at in a lot of depth. Um, at least in the games context. Um, 
And it's unclear how we can actually design games to support um, reflective processes and outcomes. Now, there has been some work in the games literature, um, and, but there is sort of conflicting ideas. Uh, and most of this comes from, from work on persuasive games rather than necessarily reflective games. And there's this concept of, of distance um, that's been kind of come up a couple of times, uh, but in different ways. So uh, Jeff Kaufman and colleagues um, argue that what you, what you want is for the distance between the player and the game to be increased so that players uh, avoid this kind of uh, feeling of reactance. So if a game is overly didactic um, and basically tells players what they should be thinking, often uh, they can respond in a sort of defensive way and kind of shut down um, and not really engage in reflectance because they, they feel in reflective processes because they feel kind of threatened in some way. So one of the strategies as part of their embodied game design model that they present is, is one called distancing, where they argue for things like fiction and fantasy and to help increase that distance so that players feel less threatened um, by the kind of messaging uh, within the game. Now, in contrast, uh, in Rilla Khaled's work, she suggests that distance should actually be decreased, right? You want to ensure that there's, there's kind of relevant experiences within the game so players can identify uh, with these and relate those experiences to, to their day-to-day -day lives. Um, so for her, this idea of kind of, you know, having kind of big distances is a problem because you're not necessarily going to get that learning to transfer um, outside of the game environment. And you're not going to necessarily have opportunities for more critical forms of reflection where, where the, the player is aware that they are reflecting and, and reflecting in a more intentional kind of a way. So what we wanted to look at here was uh, to kind of explore these kind of conflicting ideas in, in a bit more depth by looking at how we can intentionally design a game um, to support reflection. And we picked this context of, of work-life balance and specifically student life balance um, due to the challenges that students in higher education tend to face uh, when coming to its university. So they experience a number of different lifestyle changes around you know, living in a new environment um, and having to kind of balance socializing with studying and, and looking after themselves. And these can have um, a significant effects on, on their well-being as well. So I'm going to show you a short video. Well, it's actually a long video, so I'm not going to show all of it, but I'll show you a bit of the video um, to introduce the game. So it's kind of a visual novel style game where it's pretty simple, kind of point and click type interface. Um, but essentially, you're a student starting at university in your second year, you're being introduced to your housemates um, that you're going to be living with over that year. And then there's these different kind of uh, dimensions that you need to pay attention to. So the first is your academic studies, um, signified by the note paper and pen there. The second is your, your physical and mental health by the heart, the social life by the phone and, and the pound sign for, for your finances during that time. And as you play the game, you are given different kinds of things that you need to, uh, different decisions that you need to make about how you're spending your time. Sometimes it's a, you know, do you want to do this or not? Or occasionally it's, can you pick one of these three um, kind of options? And each time you pick an option, uh, a little arrow appears under one of these dimensions so that you've got some feedback about how your choices actually influence um, these different aspects of, of work-life balance. And if there's an arrow at the bottom, that means you've kind of maxed out. Um, so you're at the bottom of the academic study uh, in that case. So as the game uh, progresses, you keep getting asked these choices. Eventually, you have an assignment due um, and you get graded on the assignments as you go. Uh, but the game kind of tracks your decisions. And then. Oh, this is going to be fun. Ah, OK, so at the end of the game, uh, you get um, to attend a party and then the game sort of assesses you. Um, on the whole in terms of how your decisions have actually kind of been made. So here you can see you've got the four dimensions. The student did kind of okay about being healthy, but, but could do more to sort of be a bit more physically active and, and in terms of their mental health as well. Study, they're doing enough to get by, um, but clearly most of their choices have been about the kind of social aspects and, and spending a lot of time on that. And then that's affected their, their finances as well. So depending on the decisions that you make, you'll get different um, kind of uh, feedback for each of those items um, to get a sense of, of how you sort of performed uh, in the game. So in terms of the, the game development, uh, we worked with a, an external kind of game development. Uh, we tried to adopt a sort of player centered approach where we did a couple of rounds of play testing um, through um, the, the iterative process of developing the game and some workshops uh, with the project team. 
So there was a lot of tweaking of the scenario. So, so one of the, some of the feedback we got was around how realistic they were. So, so we, we kind of played around with uh, making sure that they felt like situations that students would actually encounter uh, as, they, as they're kind of going through their lives. On top of that, though, we didn't want to present a stereotypical kind of student experience. So we were very careful to not do things and we didn't want to alienate particular students as well. So while there were mentions of parties, we never talked about alcohol and, and that kind of a thing to make sure that people felt that they if they had different things they were interested in, they had options to do other activities um, as part of the game. At one point, we had a, a maybe option and, and players kind of struggled with this because we actually took that as a well, if you click maybe 50 50, you'll, you'll either do the activity or you won't. Um, but players interpreted that as like, I don't want to be rude. It was a maybe, maybe, you know, ask me later type thing. So they, they didn't quite understand how that function worked. Uh, one of the bigger changes was to remove the persistent bars. Um, so we had those kind of four dimensions. And at one point we had a bar and you could see it the whole time going up or down. Um, but players seem to interpret that as we want to max out the bars. Um, and actually, that's not the message that we wanted to communicate with the game, because the idea is about sort of achieving some kind of balance, right? So attempting to, doesn't mean you have to get the top of the bar for each of those activities, and you have to think about which ones you want to prioritize and, and making sure that none of them go too low, essentially. Um, similarly, we removed the percentage score at the end of the game, because that had a similar effect. People were like, no, I want a higher percentage of, of these stats, rather than thinking about how they might um, prioritize different activities and how that might influence their, their well-being. And what we did in terms of the evaluation is we actually compared two different versions of the game. And, and this is a relatively subtle manipulation, but it comes back to this concept of distance. So in the first version of the game, uh, the player is addressed as you throughout the game. Um, and they're asked to kind of uh, think about starting their second year um, at uh, York University. Um, but in the second version, we tried to kind of introduce a bit of a role playing aspect. So we asked them to take on the role of Alex uh, and we made up a, a, a random subject because we didn't want people to think, well, if we pick physics, people will be like, well, I don't do physics, so I'm not going to relate to that character. So we picked a subject that none of them would be familiar with. Um, but essentially, you know, and, and throughout the game, you're referred to as Alex as well to try and reinforce um, that you're playing as, as somebody different rather than yourself. And the idea here is that in the first version, that distance is much shorter, but in the second version, we've tried to increase that distance between the player and, and the player character within the game. And what we did is we got 32 people to, to play the game, so half in each version. Um, they played the game and they had an immediate interview afterwards about playing the game. And then we did a short follow-up interview uh, a week later um, to see kind of more about how the game had um, potentially affected them since then. Primarily, we recruited undergraduate students, uh, though we had a couple of um, postgraduate students play, and they came from, from different departments. Um, so some were computer science and psychology, but others came from history and um, engineering and, and other places as well. Now, in terms of the analysis, we did two things. So to assess the reflective outcomes, so, so what kinds of reflection people are actually engaging in, uh, we did a deductive analysis using the uh, Feck and Fitzpatrick framework to, to classify different uh, levels of reflection. And we did that only on the follow-up interview. So we wanted to look at the reflection that happened after kind of playing the game. And then we also looked at the, the process of reflection. So this was a, an inductive reflexive uh, thematic analysis where we uh, looked at both the immediate and follow-up interviews and, and, and um, uh, developed some themes uh, based on that. So in terms of the outcomes, and, and this is where I'm gonna say a little bit more about this framework. So what this framework does is it, it distinguishes between different levels of, of reflection and they're a hierarchy. So, so level zero is the lowest level and, and level four is the kind of highest level of reflection. Uh, and the first level is actually not really reflective at all, right? It's, it's basically people just sort of describing but without really saying very much. Uh, there's non-reflective description. So this is when there is a bit of description um, but it's got an extra bit of reasoning and, or explanation right around it. Level two is dialogic. So here you want to see some sort of consideration of alternative explanations and um, connecting different pieces of knowledge experience and perhaps some kind of hypothesizing uh, as well. Transformative reflection, I've, I've kind of talked about a little before, but this is a sort of change in, in practice or behavior or perhaps some kind of understanding after revisiting uh, an event. And then finally, critical reflection um, is more about situating your understanding uh, within a kind of wider socioeconomic or, or cultural or historical kind of context. Um, so this would be things like if, if you've got academics thinking about their work-life balance, they might say, well, my life is busy, but part of that is the structural kind of situation of universities and the nature of you know, UK um, higher education at this stage, right? So you're looking at the wider kind of factors that might affect 
um, uh, that situation. And in terms of it being a hierarchy, the, the higher levels tend to be rarer anyway. That's sort of common across the board, whether it's looking at teacher education or, or looking at, at kind of gameplay and stuff as well. So in terms of the reflective outcomes, uh, so we coded uh, the post-play interviews for, for um, looking for evidence of these different levels of reflection. Uh, I should say we didn't see any critical reflection, so that's why um, it's not on the table there. Um, but as you can see, um, these are the kind of reflective uh, actual sort of levels there. So the majority of players playing both versions of the game did experience um, some form of reflection after having played the game. I think it's about two thirds of the players. And there's a sort of indication here that perhaps those in the Alex condition were more likely to engage in, in higher levels uh, of reflection. Now I'm gonna give you some examples of, of the kind of thing that we, we were sort of coding. So here's a, an instance of, of sort of no impact at all. So the player, this was a very short interview. I think it lasted about two minutes, uh, but they were asked if they thought about the game, not really. Did you talk to anyone about it? No, has anything changed? Not especially. Uh, any other thoughts or comments? Nothing I didn't say last time. Do you think it prompted you to think about your own work-life balance? Uh, not really, and some laughter. So clearly this had absolutely no impact um, on the player uh, involved in, in this case. As an example of, of uh, sort of descriptive um, uh, kind of thinking there. So you've got somebody saying that they did think about the game, but actually all they really thought that it was quite fun um, and just being able to, to choose about the game and have different scenarios was, was kind of entertaining for them. But you can see that they're not really reflecting about their work-life balance. They're just kind of describing what happened um, when playing the game. And when they did think about it, it was like, oh yeah, that was nice, so. Uh, reflective description. So now we're getting into the more kind of actual, um, the, you know, the reflective kind of side of things. And here we've got somebody talking about how they did start thinking about the game, um, but they actually started thinking about their own sort of money situation um, and how they should really keep on top of that. Now they don't go very far with this, so that's why this is just description. So just being able to have enough money to kind of afford living, um, and that's kind of where it ends. But they are starting to kind of do a little bit more reflection and linking the game um, to um, aspects of, of their own life. And then dialogic reflection. So this is a, a longer quote uh, of somebody explaining about, you know, what they were thinking about the game afterwards um, and talking about how they got their exam results back um, and thinking back to the game and how and they got a D on an assignment in the game because they didn't stay um, up all night doing it. But in the last time term, because I would stay up doing a thing, I'll see what this guy does and I'll pick stay up all night. Anyway, there's a lot of information there. The point is what the player is actually doing is they're starting to kind of think through the different connections between these things. And at the end, they're coming to kind of a realization about their own life here, right? So it sort of makes me realize that it doesn't, sometimes it doesn't matter if you do stay up all night because it won't affect you that much anyway. So they're forming a kind of initial hypothesis about um, how um, these things kind of link together and how they might affect um, aspects of, of their own kind of student life. And then finally, transformative reflection. So here we have an example of something that changed um, outside of the game. Um, and here so in the game, I was trying to be very conscious uh, about money um, and the social education aspect. You know, that was the priority. So that should come second. Um, sorry, the money was the priority, right? But then they had this realization that they've actually been a little bit too restrictive in terms of their own spending. And actually they've been spending a little bit more after playing the game as they, they're kind of giving themselves a little bit of a break um, after having that kind of realization. Okay. So moving on to the uh, process of reflection. So here uh, we developed four themes uh, and some associated barriers, which I'll, I'll go into when I go through each of the themes. But these essentially are looking at, you know, how reflection actually occurred uh, through playing the game um, and what was actually um, happening because this, this also was coding the um, interviews that we did immediately after play, not just the post-play interviews that occurred uh, a week later. So the first theme was uh, making sensible consequences vis visible. So this was uh, really about how the game was a bit of a kind of university life simulator that um, you know, could make you think about a lot of the choices, but people quite liked that you, know, you made decisions and there were consequences to those and they could kind of connect those. However, there were some barriers to this. So, so one of them was, was unclear feedback. So while we did have the arrows, not everybody kind of paid attention to them or, or knew exactly what they meant. Um, also, sometimes uh, people questioned some of the consequences. So the example here of, of questioning the impact of, of buying a bicycle on finances, 
So when somebody purchased a bicycle, their finances went down, but their explanation was, but actually it saves me money in the long time because I'm not spending it on buses or, or taxis and that kind of thing. Uh, and then finally, uh, playing the game only once. So I think some players expressed a desire to play, go back and play the game again so they could see how different choices might impact um, the outcomes of the game as well. So with these things, that these are things that can get in the way of, of any kind of higher levels of reflection because once they're questioning how the game works or how it doesn't work, um, they're kind of not really thinking about their own work-life balance anymore. The second theme was, it's like my life. So this was really about how relevant they, they kind of found the game. Uh, and the quote here is somebody talking about, you know, having a bad grade and, and you know, staying up all night to try and work on your, your essay at the detriment to your health is, is a theme they recognized in, in their own life as well. Uh, there were some barriers here as well. So, so some people reported that they didn't actually find that the game relatable. It was actually perhaps a bit too generic um, or they, they saw aspects of it that, that didn't reflect um, their own kind of life um, situation. Uh, there was also a potential barrier here around game outcomes that, that contradict um, personal identity. So going back to, to player 16, so this was the one that had absolutely no impact. So every question was, nope, hasn't, haven't thought about it, haven't done anything. Uh, one of the things that player 16 uh, said when they were playing the game um, was this kind of thing about, I, I'm really good at budgeting, but the game has told me I'm not. And that felt like for them, they'd lost any opportunities for reflection because they were rejecting the whole premise of the game by that point. Um, so there was something happening here in terms of um, games kind of making people feel a bit defensive about the, the choices they were making, or perhaps just being inaccurate at kind of assessing them. Now, the third theme, and this was, this was uh, actually, we only really found this, uh, unsurprisingly, in the Alex version of the game, because uh, there wasn't an Alex in the, in the U version. Uh, but here it was about how playing as somebody else did seem to create a space where reflection uh, could occur. So here we've got somebody um, also talking about the finance side of things, but in this case, they're not taking it so personally, right? So they're starting to think about, I was disappointed because I'm quite thrifty. I like to manage money this way better than what Alex did. So I was disappointed with the grades and I would have liked more A's and B's. And throughout their kind of um, uh, interview transcript, they're jumping between these two identities. So they're, they're comparing themselves to Alex uh, in a way that didn't quite happen uh, with the U version uh, of the game. So, in contrast to the, the previous example I gave, they didn't take this so personally, right? They were still able to reflect, um, but they weren't necessarily taking it as a personal insult from the game, saying they weren't that good at, at managing their, their finances, for instance. Um, the barrier here was that not everyone took notice of Alex. It wasn't the most um, explicit of kind of manipulations. So some players never mentioned Alex at all um, and never kind of went through that process of, of comparing themselves to, to Alex in, in that kind of a way. And then finally, triggers in everyday life. So this was about how for reflection to occur, something tended to need to happen after playing the game to remind players of the game and, and link their experience back to it. So here we've got uh, an example of somebody talking about being on the bus um, and thinking about whether they're going to go to the cinema or not. Um, but um, it was being on the bus and having this conversation with their friends that got them thinking about, well, actually, if I don't go, what's it going to do to my social life? So I'm going to spend the money and, and have a, and they had a really good time in the end. So this is where the barrier really was about the timing of the game. So it took place towards the end of the of summer term. So by the time most people we spoke to them in that follow up interview, they were back home um, for the holidays. So they didn't necessarily have um, they weren't in the environments that they would be normally to, to kind of have these potential triggers. Um, for uh, stimulating or catalyzing that kind of reflection. Okay, so uh, key takeaways for the study. So it's a relatively short, simple game. It's not the most advanced game um, I've ever seen, uh, but it was enough to kind of lead to some form of self-reflection in uh, two thirds of our players. And there was some indication that, that perhaps the Alex version did allow for, for kind of more uh, chances for this higher level reflection uh, to occur, where we saw 38% of the players in the Alex version actually engaged in some kind of transformational change around how they thought about um, particular issues related to work-life balance or how they actually did something different um, in their day-to-day -day lives. And this, you know, this is interesting because it shows that even kind of small design changes could have an impact um, on what um, is happening to players. Um, but we do need more research to, to kind of look at those things in more depth and, and really understand sort of what's happening here. Um, and in terms of, of um, thinking about um, how the game kind of 
could be designed that there's certainly this 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 thing about players needing to understand the consequences of, of their choices so if you don't allow them to make that connection between what they're doing in the game and the potential outcomes um, you're probably not going to get not going to get that much more reflection um, happening after that there's also a distinction here that we talk about in the paper a bit more but but it's basically there's a difference between well, there's different kinds of distance. So there's the difference uh, between distance between the game environment and the real world. So here we had a, a relevant environment. It was set up as a kind of UK university type experience um, that, that not everyone found relevant, but the majority of our players did. Um, but that's a little bit different to the distance between the player and the player character. So that's more about your relationship to who you're playing in the game. Um, so these two forms of distance uh, can uh, have different kinds of impacts potentially and that's why we call the paper close, but not too close, because you need that kind of relevance to have these kind of um, opportunities for reflection. But perhaps a bit of distance is good so that players don't necessarily react defensively to, to what the, the game is sort of telling them. Um, but yes, so relevance is important, but allowing players to role play with someone else uh, might you know, uh, reduce the chances of reactance uh, kind of occurring. Uh, I've got a question there as well, because looking at the, the, the framework and the original definition of transformative reflection, um, they do highlight this idea that for transformative reflection to occur, it needs to be intentional. And actually, that's not necessarily something we saw our players doing. They didn't go away and sit down and think, I'm going to think about this game and think about how it's going to apply to my life. And the external triggers kind of showed that, right? It's when something came up that they started thinking about the game in more depth. Um, so there's a question there about actually... Do you need it to be an intentional experience for, for transformation to occur? And thinking about um, future work, uh, so designing for reflection, uh, there are various things that we can play around with uh, in terms of how we kind of um, present role play to, to players. And I've got a screenshot there of uh, one of the Mass Effect games um, to show an example where they are playing as Commander Shepard, but you can customize that character, right? You can put in your own kind of uh, ideas about whether they're like you or someone else. Um, you can change their first name, things like that, but you are still playing as somebody else in a particular universe that has a particular role, right? So in the game that we put across, it was a very simple form of role play that we put across, but there's certainly ways to think about how do you present role play to players and, and, and what kinds of effects would that have um, to, towards reflection? I think the exploring different triggers thing is, is also important in the sense of um, thinking about if you are gonna release a game for a particular purpose. So for instance, if we were gonna continue working on the student life balance game, then maybe we wanna think more about the timing of the release of that. Could we combine it with other university interventions that would get people to remind them to play the game or remind them to think about the game uh, at alternate points? And then again, longer term evaluation. So we did follow up with our players after one week um, it would be good to see whether um, people could play the game more than once, but also what's happening to them a month later or six months later as well. And then finally, to, to plug some sort of design resources. So Matt Whitby has uh, been continuing to work on, on Perspective Challenge, uh, but looking actually at how you can take that work and think about designing to reduce um, stigma around mental health. So he's been involved in, in writing a white paper for Take This, which is a, a games and mental health charity. Um, and is also developing a card deck that he's tested out with designers um, to help people think more about how you uh, can create games um, specifically um, to think about well-being in this context of challenging perspectives around mental health. And that's it. I'm done. Amazing. Thanks, Joe. Um, on that note, we'll take questions. Any questions from the room, conversation points, discussion? One behind you, Duncan. There you go. Thank you, Joe. Very interesting. Um, I'm really outside the space of, of gaming, so my question is probably uh, naive, but I was wondering whether you reflected on um, how much is this a game and how much is it a game-like intervention and whether the fact that it was framed within uh, the study had an influence, as in, like, or to, to another way to phrase that is, what do you think would be different, if any, if this is something that people played uh, spontaneously rather than within a specific framing? And in my mind, that's kind of related to um, the simplicity. You mentioned that like, this is not a super advanced game. I wonder yeah. if that is perhaps also a feature um, somehow. So yeah, I think that there's sort of two parts of your question. So I think that the fact that it wasn't a super advanced game, what's interesting is we still saw some effects from it, right? So you don't necessarily need, and actually a lot of the applied game literature is showing this. You don't necessarily need 
the shiny, graphically amazing game for people to um, get some kind of impact from playing it. But I think your question is about will they even want to play it? Is, is that well, no, sorry, sorry, I didn't mean it in that way. I was thinking actually about the opposite. So I understand that your, your point that like, oh, this is uh, working even though it's really simple. Yeah. Um, is there any evidence that suggests that maybe if this was not as simple as it is, yeah, people would relate it less to their life and sort of be more carried away? Uh, oh, interesting. Yeah. Uh, not that I'm aware of is the short answer, right? So I think to, in order to kind of unpack that, you'd have to look at whether there are more kind of uh, complex games that, that address a similar kind of issue. And it's not the sort of issue. I mean, you do, what's interesting is, you know, the format that we have is a standard game format. This idea of like, you know, you have a scenario, you respond to the choice that that's pretty kind of um, common, particularly in visual style novels, right? But the theme, yeah, I don't, and I also don't know what a much more advanced game would be. I suspect the challenge then, if it's too advanced, is that you have less of an opportunity to link your, your actions to particular consequences. Yeah. So I think it, you know, part of it maybe works because it is a sort of simplified simulation rather than you're attempting to model every aspect of, of the real world or, or that kind of thing. So, so I think perhaps, yeah, maybe it would be a bad idea to try and, um, to try and make something too advanced because then you lose those kind of opportunities to, to, to make those kind of assumptions and links between things. Yeah. But the, the other part of your question, I think, when you started was about whether, you know, this, you know, would it be different if people found the game and played it versus um, if you recruited them to kind of study? Uh, I'm not sure. I, I, I suspect maybe not massively, but it's something that you would probably want to do with a more of a kind of field study, right, where if you were going to release this game as, as part of um, some aspect of the university life that you'd, you'd follow up with players and, and see whether there's any kind of differences around how they respond to it. Thank you. Hi, thank you very much for this wonderful, amazing talk. Um, games are always amazing. Um, Some are more amazing than I, I'm not a biased. I'm not a biased person. Um, I'm just a, a neutral uh, judge. Anyways, um, <laughs> what I was thinking is um, browsing through your work. Um, could you, I wasn't sure if, um, so like the reflections, like the involvement of memory of players is, have you looked into this relationship? It's like how much players have to remember the, uh, the situations which happen in the game and how much they could actually. In terms of asking people about. What happened, what they did in the game and what happened in the game. So. Yeah. yeah. So we. So this was most prevalent for the, the study we did asking people about um, their experience of playing games and uh, leisure games, right? Mm -hmm. And asking them to report experiences of that and, and talk through kind of, you know, their reflections around it. So we were a little bit worried because sometimes people were like reporting, you know, things that happened a few years ago rather than necessarily um, something that happened, you know, yesterday or that kind of a thing. But uh, in a weird way, I, I'm not going to say it doesn't matter at all, but it depends what... That was interesting because we were looking at how reflection happens in play anyway, mm -hmm. right? And, and yes, you do have to be a bit careful then that, that their memories aren't going to be as specific if they're talking about something that happened a long time ago. Um, but for studies where you're looking at the impact of a particular game, um, it, it depends what you're trying to do. So, so we weren't that worried if they didn't remember everything that happened in this game. What we wanted to see was, were they connecting the game to aspects of their own life in any way? Mm -hmm. And in some ways, it doesn't matter if they, if they accurately remember what happened or not, as long as they're making those connections. Um, so again, it depends on your question and, and what you're trying to look at. Maybe so uh, to, to concrete the, the question, because I was thinking, yeah. coming out of this uh, social anxiety bubble, yeah. Um, there's like evidence that people with social anxiety tend to have a biased a memory about yeah. their social in encounters and stuff like that. And so I was wondering, um, during my PhD, there was like, we, we had this idea if we can actually use games as a way to, to um, create memories and to like use this as a um, sort of assessment to say, okay, how are they remembering their experiences during the game? Um, and that was so, so like, sorry. Were you trying to change their memories, or just trying to see how they remember how they um, interpret the um, in their memories, like where the social encounters uh, positive or not as friendly? It's like to see how um, their biases are basically uh, manifesting during their uh, memory phase. That's interesting, and I wonder. Yeah, there probably could be more work. There's more work starting to be done to look at 
particularly when you're looking at games for well-being, kind of understanding a bit more about who your participants are in the first place to see, yes, if they have issues around social anxiety or depression, for instance, that can also um, affect how people kind of remember stuff. So looking at, uh, you know, how what their experiences of the game are and how they remember them could be another avenue to, to look at. But yes, for me, then I'd want to know, but does that impact their reflection or not? Right. And how does it impact that reflection? So, um, but yeah, it's an interesting angle. Thanks. Thank you very much. You can try, but it's not my area of expertise. Uh, so just being curious, I mean, it's actually very important about immersion and bring yeah. all the possible positive kind of outcomes. So is that possible to measure even control about immersion in your study? And I was just wondering, for instance, a high level immersion actually lead to high level of reflections or what's your finding from you? And let's speak to quality yeah. for the question, sorry. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. So so immersion is, yeah, there are measures of immersion. So so Anna and Paul Cairns have been involved in developing a scale for immersion that you can look at for, for game experiences. Um, and that is something that John used in, in, his, his, in his study looking at um, uh, how players, you know, to, to assess people's reported accounts, right? So they, they remembered an event and then they assessed um, the immersion of that event by, by pulling in the scale, right? Yeah. But that was about their kind of recovery experiences. So, so I haven't actually looked at immersion and reflection. So that is, a, is something that is interesting, but, but again, further research. So, um, but yes, you can, the short answer is you can measure immersion and, and John's a good person to talk to about that. And the question is not basically, for if people are immersed during the gaming process, yeah. for instance, but what can be the outcome? Are they more just about themselves in the game or just about the outcome of the game? Is that possible to study just outside the research? Yeah. So if they're immersed, how do you study the outcomes? Yes, I'm like, more about you into the game or more about the outcome of the game, for instance. So you can, so, yeah, so you can certainly use scales like the immersion experience questionnaire to 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 get them to to think about what they were experiencing in the game and then to to rate that according to those scales. Yeah. It's it's quite hard to capture immersion as it's happening. Yeah. Um, right. So so that's a bit of a challenge. But the what you would probably do if you want to link it to outcomes is you need some way of assessing the outcomes and then comparing the two. And the outcomes will will vary depending on the kind of game that you're you're designing and what the purpose of, of that game is. Yeah. But there are, now that you've raised it, so, so it's something that, that in, in Rilla Khaled's work, she talks about, there's a sort of tension actually in that games are immersive, but actually if you want people to critically reflect, you don't want them to be completely immersed, right? Yeah. So, because there's a tension there, right? If I'm, if I'm completely caught up in something, then how can I kind of reflect on it? So, so there's a call for, you know, looking at things like you see techniques in theater, for instance, where they try and, and, and encourage the audience to break immersion and, and you know, question what the, the, the actors are doing and that kind of stuff. And there are some experimental games that are looking at, at that kind of different sorts of player experiences that are less about immersion and more about this, this kind of critical thinking as well. Yeah, but you do, I think there's, I think what's interesting there is that the potential, um, I think that tension can something can, is something that designers could exploit mm -hmm. um, by thinking about, okay, well, if we're not going to just design for an immersive experience, what does that look like? And, and how do we do it in a way that is still somehow engaging to people, but not necessarily um, what you'd classify as immersion? Thank you. Thanks. Anyone else? Or are we? Yeah, I think we are good. Thank you so much. Oh, well, thank you very much.